So this session, uh, we're going to talk to our panel. It's called 100,000 Voices. You can find the, the synopsis, if you like, in your programme. And it's a chance to hear about awareness raising champions within the community. And that can be all different ways. Um, sadly, we couldn't be joined by Ella today as she is poorly. Ella raises awareness on TikTok and has uh, over a million followers. And if you look at the sides, she's the, she's the blonde lady. We are trying to get her to uh, digitally get in on the acoustic stage. So if that happens, we will let you know. But I am going to ask you guys just to introduce yourself and um, a little bit about how you raise awareness. And I apologise, I forgot to send them questions. Uh, so I'm taking you all completely by surprise. So Carol, do you want to start? Ladies first. Oh, thanks. <laughs> um, I'm Carol Huntley, along with Graham Huntley, organised the North East Group. Um, and we got involved because Graham was diagnosed um, about 16 years ago now. Sorry, oh. Right, one second. Is that better? Oh, no. Sorry. Yeah. Is that better? No. Nope. I don't do shouting. <laughs> <laughs> um, right. Graham was diagnosed about 16 years ago. Um, and as part of that, I take on the role of, of Graham's carer when needed, along with my two phenomenal sons who will not admit they are carers, but they do do that role. And in, alongside Graham and the two boys, we do a lot of race, like awareness raising where we can, getting information out there for who don't know. We put packs in the hospital for where people go and get their first appointments for their, their Botox injections and things. And we also try and do fundraising where we can in whatever shape or form we can. We've done various bits over the years. As Dana knows, different cake sales and fun runs. And we also help Dana with the team with the, the Great North Run, trying to find runners to run it and raise awareness of their just giving pages and things to get the support that they need. Brilliant, thank you. DK, would you like to go next? Yeah, um, I'm uh, DK McPhee. Um, I'm, somebody who's had dystonia now for 40 years. This is my 40th anniversary, actually, so anyway. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I've been around for quite a while. I think one or two people actually know me from way back in the day, in 1983 or so. Um, I was involved with the setting up of the self-help group in Glasgow um, and in, throughout Scotland, actually, way back in the day. And then I worked for the Dystonia Society for four years, travelling up and down to London fairly regularly um, and um, basically trying to do some work in Scotland. Um, I suppose you can see I've got torticollis, uh, spasmodic torticollis, uh, and it's affected my life quite a lot, to be honest with you, but at the same time, my view is quite simple. I just keep going. Um, you do the best with what you've got. And there are good days and bad days. But at the end of the day, you know, if it wasn't a good day, I wouldn't be here today. So um, I'm just pleased to be here, to be honest with you. There's a lot going on, uh, but I'm sure we'll cover that very, very quickly in a few minutes' time. Thank you very much. Hugh, off with you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Q. Um, I was gifted with dystonia back in 2013, so I'm fairly new to the family of dystonia. Um, but firstly, thank you very much for everyone for being here. Without you guys, these sort of events wouldn't take place. Um, I became an ambassador last year. Um, this is the first time I can honestly say that I do not need to apologize that I have a problem with my speech. Generally, whenever I'm speaking in, in, in anywhere, I have to apologize because people can't understand what I'm saying. So uh, I'm sure as we go through the day, I'll, I'll get the chance to speak to most of you. If there's anyone who wants particularly to come and talk to me, please feel free. I'll be sort of wandering around outside in this room or the other room. Brilliant, thank you. And I don't know if the people at the back can see, but if you do see Q walk around, it's wearing the most fantastic shoes. They rival mine, they're brilliant. Um, okay, so you guys all raise awareness in very, very different ways. And Ella, if she was with us in another way, can I ask, why is it important? I guess that's the question. We get asked most, what is dystonia? Like when we're out and about and we're talking to people, that's the question. And I know it gets asked of our audience when they say, we have dystonia, right? So why would you say it's important to raise awareness in as many ways as we can? DK, I'm going to hand over to you. I think it's really important. One of the things that 
um, that I set out to do way back um, when I was working for the society was to raise awareness in Scotland. And I suppose, in a sense, I was quite lucky. I'm, I speak, um, well, a number of languages effectively, but I was born, my first language was, was Gaelic, Scottish Gaelic, because I was brought up in an island in the Western Isles. Um, so, you know, English is a kind of foreign language to me, in a sense. Um, but obviously, you know, from day to day, that's that's what I do. But my job actually nowadays is actually around the Gaelic language as well as, as well as English. Um, I think it's important just to go and tell people what dystonia is all about. I mean, obviously, it affected me directly, but also it affected my family. And you, all of you will have will have said, you know, what's wrong with you? And, you know, why have you got this, etc. Well, you have to try and explain it, and it's quite a difficult thing to explain to to many people. But for me, it's a case of you have to go out there and, and say to people, you know, I've got dystonia, it's a neurological disorder. I've had it for 40 years. It affects my life in this way and this way and that way. Um, and people people understand. People are people are fine, I think, with that. You know, once you actually try and explain it to them because they, they think they know, <laughs> but obviously you don't. Uh, and I think, you know, being public about it, to me, is, is the right thing to do. I mean, I've... Never hidden away from it. You know, I've always kind of um, fought against it, I suppose, and I probably always will. Um, and I've done it my own ways. I mean, I, when I worked for the society, you know, one of the things was to raise awareness, and it was my own family circle of friends, but also the people who volunteered to help us set up the Estonian Society in Scotland at that time. Uh, and all of us said, you know, we've got to go and raise publicity, and you know, and raise promote, uh, promote awareness. I have a lot of friends who work in the media, and I'll be blunt about it. I use them, you know, to promote awareness. Um, with, something very special, hey? Yeah, I mean, you know, I think you know, if it's important, you know, at the end of the day, because if we've all got contacts. We'll all know somebody who will know somebody, um, and it's important to put ourselves forward. I think, you know, we're all individuals. We're all special in that way. So, so why not kind of like do it? And, you know, I think over, over time, you know, that kind of um, doing stuff in the papers, doing stuff on radio and TV. Um, and then eventually, a few years ago, did a documentary with the BBC. It was a, a, a BBC Alapa uh, documentary, so it's in Gaelic. Um, but it was, it was broadcast, it's been broadcast quite a few times now. And um, there are subtitles as well, so... People can actually understand it if you don't understand Gaelic. Um, and it's shown, I believe, in, in the acoustic room at some point later yes. today. So, so if anybody wants to see the film, I think it's a quarter past three in the acoustic room. So there we go. That's my promotion. Nice. Anyway. <laughs> <Well done. laughs> As someone that really enjoys plugging our stuff, I'm impressed by that. Carol, what about you? Would you say... Because obviously with you, it's the group and you raise awareness as a, as a group. Can you talk to us a little bit about why that's so important? I think for us originally when Graham first got diagnosed there was so little information out there for us to find very easily. We didn't know many up in the northeast that suffered from the same condition as what Graham has and it was really hard just getting that support around. Um, we started with a very small group that used to meet in a little cafe for lunch. Um, no, it was somewhere else originally. It was in a little cafe wow. um, owned by one of the group herself owned the cafe. So we started off in there. And when, when the cafe closed, that's when we moved to the Toby Carvey. Okay. And we've stayed at the Toby Carvey ever since because it's our favourite place to go. Yeah. Can't go wrong with the Toby Carvey. Um, they also, the Toby that we go to are really supportive as well. And they make us they make the space available for us, for those with wheelchair access and everything. They're, they're absolutely fab, sorted out for us. But for Graham to have, because Graham was quite young and it came out of nowhere. I mean, Graham was 35, I think, was it, Graham, when you were diagnosed? And it literally, he got up one morning and it was it was like the world had gone wrong. And it took us a long time to get the diagnosis. We were told he'd slept funny for nine months um, until we pushed for second opinions and things. And just getting that information out there so that others don't feel so isolated. We felt completely isolated with a five-year-old child and I was pregnant with my second one. So we felt totally isolated, didn't know who to go to, didn't know who to talk to for like where Graham could go. We met an absolutely phenomenal lady who was involved with the group originally. Um, she's not with us at the group at the minute for personal reasons, but she was in the, um, just outside the doctor's room where Graham went to Watergate Hospital and he had his first injections there. This lady introduced us to the group. She was part of the group, Pauline had, was part of it at the time. And it just developed, it was just, it really was just people who had the same condition meeting for lunch 
and being able to talk to people who understood where you were coming from. You weren't made to feel different because of the, the way your symptoms kind of came about. But then later on, we, when we joined with Dystonia UK, we, we knew we needed someone that would look after the group and keep it going. So Pauline and Graham did it originally, and then it's now Graham and I. But it's just making sure that, because we do get that question, like, what is dystonia? How do you deal with it? Is it genetic? And lots and lots of questions. But I would rather answer those questions and make people more aware so they can, when we go out, Graham doesn't feel now. Originally, Graham wouldn't go out because he felt so different and he was he's in a difficult position. He wouldn't go anywhere. So he isolated himself originally. But now that there's more awareness about it and people are more open to talk about it, there's, that has gone, that stigma has gone. So he's now quite happy to go out and he's more active now than he's ever been promoting it to get the information out there. So you just have to get that information out there to stop people feeling uncomfortable around others. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's one of the hardest things about the condition, isn't it? And also it pre presents in so many different ways. And a quick plug, if you'd like to know about running a group or going to a group, those these guys are in the acoustic stage tomorrow morning. Which I like a plug, I did say. But cute. <laughs> You mentioned something earlier because you said it's the first time you haven't had to apologise for your speech. That must be quite freeing. The thing is, um, each one of us are different and we all have a story. To be honest, when I first had dystonia, I did not actually acknowledge I had dystonia. It took me probably a good part of three years to actually come to terms with it that I did have dystonia. I put it down to my lifestyle because obviously I'm a very active in what I do. Um, I wear three or four different hats. My main sort of passion is sports. I'm involved in cricket. So when I did get um, diagnosed with dystonia, um, and obviously I met Dana, um, I, what I wanted to do was basically uh, provide the knowledge um, and use the medium of sport to be able to promote dystonia. Um, a lot of it is to do with knowledge. Um, people confuse dystonia with lots of other conditions. Um, and, you know, for example, like, uh, you know, my own grandchildren will ask me, you know, granddad, are you going to have Parkinson? Are you going to have this? Are you going to have that? And I have to explain to them that this is not, you know, uh, Parkinson. This dystonia is a completely different condition. Um, so I think for me, it's a case of actually you know, being able to speak to the contacts I have using my networking and to be able to promote dystonia. Um, unlike lots of other charities, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to say it or not, dystonia doesn't have a, a huge budget to be able to spend on PR and uh, marketing. So I think, you know, from my point of view, rather than sort of adding financial resources, if I can use my network to be able to promote dystonia, then that obviously does a lot. Um, you know, I'm pretty lucky in the sense that I have some really, really good friends who will actually, from time to time, sort of uh, mention dystonia. So um, I think anything we can do to provide knowledge to the rest of the community uh, is a great thing. Uh, the biggest challenge for me, like I said, you, you mentioned about sort of you know, apologizing for uh, speech, is simple things like I have a tremor in my right hand. So for example, like when I attend meetings, um, I mean, I can show you now. So you know, just being able to pick up a glass is, is difficult in, in itself. So when I'm in meetings, what I tend to do is, you know, if someone offers me tea or coffee, I, I have to refuse it, not because I, I don't want to drink it, but because I can't. Um, and, and simple things like going into buildings where someone asks you to sign in, I can't even do that. So it takes me about 10 minutes just to sort of sign my signature in. So I think you know, when, when that happens to me, I, I obviously try to explain to people I have a medical condition and then they ask me what it is. And I think even simple things like that make a lot of difference. And people actually have, you know, have a lot of understanding as long as they know what, they, what they're dealing with. Um, I also work in property in, in, in a retirement sector and it's, it's really, really funny because whenever I attend like launches where I meet clients, the first thing the people tell me is, oh, you got a problem with your throat. What you need to do is take some strepsils or you need to take rennies. And I explain to them, no, this is not, you know, I don't have a flu. You know, a lot of other people walk away from me because they think I've got, you know, I'm suffering a flu or something because of my speech. Um, so it, 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 you know, we all do our bit. And, you know, you guys are here today doing your bit. So it's a case of actually sharing our experiences with others and making sure they understand what dystonia is all about. Thank you. Very well said. Um, it's interesting, I was watching the audience while you were speaking and there was a lot of nodding when you were talking about some of the 
perhaps more frustrating if you don't mind me saying things about having the condition and nobody knowing what it is it isn't just that you have the condition it's also that you feel you have to apologize for having it because there's no there's no roadmap and for anyone that's seen um some of the webinars we've done we often say that if you have a condition that is well known and you say to someone i have a condition and this is what it is they have a they have a roadmap in their brain and they can go oh yeah okay and they can picture your journey you say dystonia and no one knows what it is. So then not only do you have to, which can be for some embarrassing, say, I have a condition, but then you also have to explain it. And so now you're apologizing again. And I think one of the reasons that we are so keen to raise awareness in every medium that we can, from the groups to social media to business, is that we want to stop that question. We want to stop the what is dystonia. We want to get to the, oh, yeah, okay, and then deal with the rest of it. So um, one of the things, or one of the people even, that Q very nicely introduced us to, who will be here tomorrow, uh, is a very amazing man called Bob, who made us Charity of the Year, um, a masquerade ball that he threw last year. So we got to get in front of lots of business people and explain what dystonia is, and that, for us, was brilliant. Um, we're talking about sort of different mediums then. DK, obviously, we went... <laughs> had a wonderful um, uh, TV program, which I'm hoping if you haven't seen, please do catch. What was the reception to that like? Um, I think it was, it was phenomenal, actually. Um, it was broadcast on BBC Alap, or just the BBC Gaelic channel. I say it's, it, it's in, it, some of it's in English, quite a lot of it's in English, actually, but the subtitles for the rest of it. But everybody who saw it without fail came back with a very positive response. Uh, some people knew me, obviously, um, got quite a wide circle of, of, of friends. And they all, thought, they all thought, well, you know, this is quite a brave thing to do. And to me, yeah, OK, <laughs> if you want to call it brave, that's fine. But for me, it was just part of, you know, literally raising awareness. I think the reason why I did it was because just to see if it could help anybody, you know, one single person who had dystonia and didn't actually know about it or had it and didn't have any support, then that would have done the job for me. As it happens, loads of people came back in that situation from all the different, whether it's on Twitter, whether it's on Facebook, whether it's on Instagram, whether it's just emails or whatever, and, and basically said they, they had received some kind of strength from it and confidence in themselves. And that kind of like, for me, that, that did the business. But we also, um, it, was a, it was a very, very well produced documentary. You know, um, I worked with a company called Scale Media. Um, and they, they, they spent, I mean, we, we took a long time over it. It took, I suppose, the best part of two years because we, we ended up doing it over COVID as well. So, and I was traveling up and down to London trying to get um, my botch line of talks and injections. They were filming down there, they were filming on the train, they filmed around the house, they filmed around Glasgow. Um, we couldn't get into more work because, well, we weren't at work at the time. And so there's a lot of things going on, but um, it took the best part of two years to get the whole thing done, but it was very, done very professionally. Um, we won um, an award for this, a, a Gaelic Media Awards um, in, in Scotland, and we won the, the best documentary prize for that. Um, we also came very close to winning the what was called the Celtic Media Festival Prize for the best documentary in Brittany, and um, I travelled over for that and um, met various people in, who speak different minority languages, and um, they were well taken by it. The point about all of that is that so many more people saw that, and it's not just in Scotland, not just in England, not in Wales, in Northern Ireland or Ireland. It was also in mainland Europe. And I think that's kind of that's really interesting, you know, because it means that the word of, about dystonia has been promoted far more widely than just kind of like locally, um, and it's done through, you know, let's say Gaelic and English. I hope that uh, we'll be able to put um, the film up on YouTube at some point. There, there are a number of um, issues around that potentially, but um, hopefully we can do that. But um, as Dana says, you'll be able to see that film later on this afternoon. And hopefully you, you do get a chance to, to see it. Um, you know, like the rest of the guys, I mean, I'm more than happy to answer any questions from anybody at any point. So I'll be around for the two days. And um, if you grab me, that's fine. But just make sure you've got a glass of wine or a pint because it's better that way. <laughs> 
Has anyone seen it? I'm going to go really old school here and not Slido. Has anyone already seen the... Yeah. yeah. Did you guys enjoy it? Really good. I'm going to put you on the spot now because it's on stage. You've got to say yes. <laughs> really good. It was really good, wasn't yeah, it? Really good. Um, it, it's interesting because obviously we deal with it every day and we live in this world and it's, it's always fascinating to me. I knew nothing about Estonia before I got this job five odd years ago. And now when people know nothing about Estonia, I just go, what do you mean you know nothing? It's a... Uh, it, 100,000 people. And just to put that in perspective, um, Parkinson's, I believe, and someone will correct me if I'm wrong, is about 140, 150,000. So it's not that much more, but it is that much better known. And I think that, you know, we've got nearly 200 people in the room today. If we can all go away and raise awareness in any means that you can, and you only talk to one person, that's another 200 people that know about the condition. What's, what's it called? What's the... Uh... Oh, I'm not going to pronounce that. Off you go. <laughs> <laughs> I'm giving you, I'm giving you garlic lessons yet, Dana. Uh, Bear is ear. It's called. It means uh, life at an angle. It's called dystonia. Then Bear is ear, which is translated as dystonia, life at an angle. I don't really know why they chose that particular title, but anyway, yeah, there we go. <laughs> in, in your program, so it's it's under the thing, so you'll be able to. You're very welcome. Um, and if anyone has any questions, by the way, do feel free. We're, we're, this is uh, an easy session, as, as most of them will be. And I don't know if we mentioned at the beginning, but if you feel the need to get up and walk around or you need to move, please don't feel like anyone would think you were being rude. We won't. Um, I just might look at you funny. Uh, OK, so that's the, that's the program. Q, you're interesting because you raise awareness around the world. Talk to me about cricket, if, please tell me I don't get this wrong. Talk to me about cricket and a patch on a cricket uniform in a different country. That should be a lead in. Yeah, so um, I used to play um, club cricket and it was actually at a cricket match that I realised that something was not right. Um, previously, my wife used to say that when I used to watch TV, um, my head used to nod. And I just sort of ignored her. And then one day I was actually playing cricket. Um, I'm a bowler, um, so I went to bowl. And as I went to bowl, my arm just seized. Um, and as I let him go off the ball, um, the guy hit me for a six. So, you know, that, that, that didn't go down well. So I, I didn't really take much notice of it. So I did the same thing again, second ball, same thing, the arm just seized. And effectively, I got hit for six again, so two sixes. <laughs> Uh, and I asked my captain at the time, I said, look, I think I've got a problem with my arm. And he said, just because you got hit for two sixes, that doesn't mean you're going to come off. And I said, no, no, really, there is something wrong. Um, so, you know, on Monday I went and did a, a medical and uh, I had a brain scan. And they said, yeah, you know, you do have this condition. But obviously it took a few years to, to come, come through. My passion for the game of cricket was always there. So the fact that I couldn't play anymore, um, I decided to actually set up a foundation. Um, the foundation is called, is yeah. the foundation is called Hammer Foundation. And from 2017 till two, two, you know, just after COVID, um, we spent a lot of time with um, kids, uh, underprivileged kids in, um, nationally in the UK. And effectively what we did was we sort of promoted um, cricket. Um, and what I was trying to do was to sort of basically give the kids the skills, life skills, so that they can have the confidence to be able to uh, associate with uh, other kids in school and just be able to sort of uh, understand teamwork, team bonding. Um, and that led me to actually sort of buying my own cricket team um, sort of in 2021. Um, so, uh, as you do. So, uh, effectively, what this story has uh, uh, done for me is had, had, and that's why I said right at the start, I was gifted with dystonia. Had I not had dystonia, I probably wouldn't be sitting here. And my lifestyle has completely changed in the sense that, you know, once I got dystonia, what it did for me was basically made me step back and relook at my lifestyle. And in order to, rather than just you know, trying to do things for myself, it gave me an opportunity to, to be able to help others. And I think for me, Estonia, it, what, it was definitely a gift. And through cricket, you know, um, and I travel around the world. Um, I generally spend three to four months in a year around the world uh, through cricket. So I am trying to promote Estonia, not only in the UK, but around the world. Well, that's a really lovely plug to Estonia around the world, which will be launching in the acoustic room at some point today. Um, thank you. That was a nice lady. Uh, I think what's fascinating is that the three of you raise awareness in very different ways. 
But you've all said exactly the same thing, which is that actually why you do it is to help other people and it isn't about helping yourselves. It will have that added benefit, but that's not that's not the cause for doing it. Um, Carol, I know when you raise awareness with the group, because I've been at some of the events, it's as much about bringing the group together as it is about raising awareness outside of that, right? It is, yeah, because some of them don't go like to work socially unless they're with the group because they find it difficult. So when we're all in group together. When I think back over the years what we've done, we've done tiny little cake sales in my office where it was just Graham wasn't even there, it was myself who did it with my office and the girls I work with. And then we've done stalls at, at fairs where we've had people stand on this on the stall with us to explain what the condition is. We've done the picnic in the park. That was fun. There was a dog. Anyone, in fact, in the program, there's a picture of Carol and I with their little dog, and I love that dog. I was supposed to be working all day, and all I did was sit and pet a dog. Yeah. Great, great He's gorgeous, bless him. Um, but we, we try and, whatever we do, it isn't about how much money we raise either. It's just getting everybody together, getting everybody to have some fun and just some chill time with one another. But then the awareness and the fundraising comes alongside that. So some of the events have been tiny little bits of money and then no money at all, to be fair, on one of them it was just a social event that we all got together. But it meant we were all together in that, in that little, little spell of time. And it, it just meant that the group can kind of feel part of something. And we are, that's what our group is. It's one of the best things I've done with the Dystonia stuff with Graham was the group to keep everybody together and the group it, it has spells where there's just a few of us and then there's spells where there's about 25 or 30 of us together. It just depends how many people from the group are available, but the, the group membership is quite, quite a lot bigger than that. But the, some of them are just not comfortable to come out to an event with us. So we'll do things like go and, and meet them one-on-one -on -one if we need to, if they just want an initial chat. Graham tends to do a lot of it because I do, I do work full time. So Graham does a lot of the initial introductions and then gives them the, the kind of the info on what we do. But then we both run all the other stuff behind. So it's, it's getting them all together just so that they're more comfortable with one another. That particular picnic in the park, do you remember the furry animals? Yes, I do. Not real furry <laughs> animals, I might add, because the dog was real. But we encountered, and we were en masse, we were moving from one location to another. So we had the banners and the flags and wherever I am, by the way, you'll see merch because I love it. We had the picnic blankets, which are currently covering the tables and the bottles. And we didn't have the teddy bears, they're new. Um, so we were moving all of this. I don't even remember why we were moving, but we were moving. We were moving for the sun, if I remember right. The sun had moved from where we were So we were, we were chasing it. And out of nowhere came four or five fully human-sized furry animals <laughs> and they all ran up to us because we're now on mass moving stuff and they I don't even know what they were trying to do but because I really thought it would make a good picture I made them stop and then we told them all about Estonia for about 45 minutes <laughs> so now there are four furry animals running somewhere around Newcastle who very much know what the conditioner is <laughs> there, there are pictures on our Instagrams and fundraising and Facebook yeah and it just goes to show, it, big group or small, it doesn't matter. It's just all about really, you know, we called it 100,000 voices because there's 100,000 people in the UK who are estimated to have the condition, and we do think that's a low-ball number. But we need to, A, get more awareness out, and B, gather up those people that don't know that there is, A, a charity to support them, but more importantly than the charity, there's a whole community that is coming together. And the more we can do that the more we raise awareness just naturally. We get, um, we get questions about why, why is dystonia not covered, for instance, on EastEnders. It's very difficult to get a situation covered on EastEnders if anyone wants to know. But the louder our voices are, the more people will listen. Um, and there is a, a lovely reporter in the room somewhere, I don't know where, because I've yet to actually been able to stop and say hello, but there is a lovely reporter in the room um, who is going to very kindly, kindly talk about us. Um, so we need your help. We need your help to raise awareness. Um, so if you have contacts and if you have people that you know, or if you have people that just want to meet up and go to a park, you know, there are loads and loads of ways you can do that. We've got loads of information outside um, that people can pick up and share. We've got posters for clinics. 
there are lots of ways that raising awareness happens and these guys are doing an amazing job so what i think i'm going to do is open the floor to questions if anyone has them just i've realized that i'm the runner oh we have a question excellent i'm the runner normally for the rest of the sessions with the microphone and i'm up here so i can't run but someone will vic's gonna run we have a question you can put your questions on slido by the way in case we didn't say that it's not just about um polls and stuff you can put your questions there you absolutely can and we have got a question for dk is dk's video on dystonia also available on youtube and or bbc iplayer to enable sharing if yes can we share the link unfortunately not yet um they put it on iplayer when um the program is, is broadcast and then it's on for about 28 days after that but then they bring it down so it's not one of those ones that's on for 12 months or so um I'm trying to get. I'm trying to sort out the YouTube thing. Um, I probably can't do it. To be fair, it's just I'm a wee bit kind of like cautious about that because I know the the people who who um, made the film and I know some of the rules around the broadcasting of things like that on YouTube, etc. So, but I think we'll probably do it at some point. So, but right now I'm afraid not. But see, when I do get it on, um, I'll pass it on to Dana, and I'm sure kind of they'll then be passed on to the rest of you. Um, Sorry, we're just going to do a work thing. I wonder if we can host it on our website so it isn't. I wonder, I, yeah, I, I, I'll, I'll try and find out about that yeah. because I did think about that as well as another option. Yeah. Um, but it, again, I'll, I'll try and find out. Okay. I'll ask the producer of the program because um, she knows the ins and outs of these things. But uh, yeah, I, I, it, it's, it, it is. I mean, I'm not just saying because it was, a, it was a very good film, but I think it's worthwhile seeing purely because a lot of the issues that I went through, I think, you know, many of you will have gone through or your families have gone through. Um, I think the family thing is really important it's all, and friends as well. It's often forgotten what they do. Um, I mean, Carol, here's an example of somebody who's doing it for Graham. But, you know, but there, are, there are many others that are, that are, that are do the same thing. Um, Fiona, my own wife, she does things, you know, she's a, a big golfer um, and um, she does, she was a lady captain at our golf club um, recently raised some money for the stone, yeah, but I don't know, it was about 1,200 quid or something like that. But next year, um, because she's a retiring captain or something, then they've got another day coming up, so you're going to get some more money from that. But, Amazing, so, but the, the point of it being is just that people know, because you know that, that whole year there, um, there was information at the, the golf course, and people would be coming and going, and they know all about it, et cetera, et cetera. So, that will happen again. And again, it's a simple thing that anybody can do. You know, if you're a member of any kind of like sports club, I mean, football's my thing, but, um, but if you're into golf or you're into cricket or whatever, then you know, there, are, there are clubs that you can associate with and ask them to support Estonia um, because they, they, all, they always do it. I mean, there's loads of charity stuff goes on with these things. Um, and I think it's a fantastic way of raising awareness and money. No, it is. And funny enough, Surrey Cricket Foundation, which you mentioned, is very kindly doing a bucket uh, drop for us, uh, probably later in the year or next year now, we're just trying to get that all sorted out. So yeah, if, if you guys know clubs and things, all of it. And it, it's, Dana, we've yes. got a question from the audience. Can I oh, throw yes. over? You've, why not? <laughs> Hi, yeah. Um, my name's Jonathan Herlock. I've had cervical dystonia for 13 years. And I feel that it's about time the Dystonia Society had a representative in central government to fight our case, i.e. either the, the health minister himself to stand up in the House of Commons and put the point of Dystonia across to the House of Commons. Because myself, I've, I've had this condition for 13 years and just trying to claim benefits has been a nightmare because every time I have to go and have a health assessment, I have to explain to a so-called health professional what dystonia is because they haven't a clue. Yeah, it's a tough one. Um, and funny enough, some of the sessions a little bit later are going to touch on that. Um, and Vic's got some news to, to share with you uh, next. It, it is difficult. We fight those battles with um, the Neurological Alliances. And so we join with other charities to amplify the voices and 
you have to start somewhere, right? So neurological um, conditions as a whole are underrepresented. So we're working sort of step by step. So bear with us, we will get there, it is our aim. Um, and if anyone has any sort of political friends that we can we can talk to, we are always happy to go and do that. It's a tough nut to crack, but it is. I'm looking at Chris as he's looking at me. It is on our agenda. It doesn't drop off our radar. It's just a lot of that sort of happens behind the scenes, and you don't see it as much. Um, but we're on it. Leave it with me. Again, I think that's it's a really important point at the end of the day that um, politicians, whether it's a national level or whether it's a local level. We should always be um, canvassing them uh, all the time, frankly, and just tell them about it because I work in local government in Glasgow and, and again, kind of like questions like this do come up for different you know, issues. And there's no reason at all why your own local councillors and so on should not be asking questions locally and also regionally when it comes down to your MPs. There's going to be an election almost certainly in the, in the next I don't know, 12, 18 months at the latest, um, you should be, right now, you know, canvassing your local politicians and saying to them, listen, what are you going to do about dystonia and neurological disorders? And I think, you know, like that campaign um, that Dana mentioned there, I think with the other neurological charities is really, really powerful. Um, but for dystonia, people, you know, you're quite right, people don't know what dystonia is. You know, GPs don't know about it, but the general public don't really know about it. Politicians definitely don't. But it's their job to go out there and make sure that something's done on behalf of their constituents. So I would encourage everybody to go and speak to local politicians, but also your national politicians, whether it's Westminster or in our case, we've got Westminster and, and uh, in Edinburgh. Um, you know, there's been some, one or two things have happened in Edinburgh, certainly kind of like at a Scottish level, that we've had um, some kind of ministerial reception, you know, in the evening. And again, it's a very specific thing about dystonia. There's one about four years ago, if memory serves me right. Um, we, should, we should be doing more of that kind of stuff. You know, there's no reason why we cannot go out there and publicise, promote what dystonia is all about. But, you know, and every single one of us can do that. We're all voters at the end of the day. Everybody counts. So your voice is just as important uh, as, as anybody you know, sitting up here. Um, and these guys can make a difference. The more we do it, the more chance we have of getting success. And you know, the election's coming up next year. It's a great time to go and um, promote Estonia. Thanks, DK. I completely agree. Everyone can write to their MPs. I can see you waving, Vic. Give me one second. I've got one on the on Slido, so just give me one minute. Uh, we've been asked, how would you set up a fundraising event in your local area? Carol, I'm going to throw that to you, because you do lots of fundraising in the local area. Um, it depends what kind of fundraising event you're after. I've done things in my local office. We've done stalls at um, like big fair events where we've had a, and we, I think we had, if I remember right, we had a big gazebo set up. We had a tombola running. We had domino cards running. We had a, a girls and boys pick and mix thing where they just picked a bonus thing out the, out the bucket and they got whatever was wrapped up. Um, it's, it's kind of finding out what events are on in your area and getting in there and see if you can get a stall and get the support from your group around you. Like we, If we get a stall somewhere, we call on our group for donations and things, for calling on friends and family. If we're going to do like a tombola type thing, we'd call on everybody we know to get those donations in so we can run the tombola on the day, if we can get in at a local, a local fair in, in that way. Or you've got the bigger... We did the fun run in Saltwell Park a few years ago, myself and Matthew, um, and another friend and we just did it off our own we entered and and ran it in the funds we raised went direct to dystonia uk so it really it depends what kind of event you're after but there, there are usually lots of opportunities to do craft fairs and things but it, they take a little bit more organization but any of the little smaller like runs and we can't we've tried twice with the um the 5k one for cancer research and they have a none of it for running for another charity at all we have tried numerous times but just see, depending on what you want to do, find out what's on in your area and then get involved in that way. And there's lots of, um, there's, as Carol said, there's lots of fun runs that you can do or the GNR is coming up in September. Um, on our website it has lots of information and if anyone is actually curious, come and find me during the day at some point and I will happily talk through it. Question at the back. Hi, um, I just wanted to ask, has anyone else got any mental health problems along with dystonia? Mm. Good 
Good question. Uh, we do have a session on that coming up. Yeah. But if I can maybe make it a little, a little broader so as not to put anyone on the spot. Um, mental health is something that often gets spoken about with dystonia. Would you guys agree that whether the dystonia causes mental health or the mental health, you know, there are just good days and bad, right? I think they're all, they're, they're kind of interlinked. I know from personal experience, not just with Graham, but others that we know in the group, some of them have had um, bouts of depression and anxiety alongside that. And I don't know if it's just because of the way they feel with their condition or if it's an underlying or what, but a lot of them, it does come hand in hand with that, unfortunately. And it's, it's just a, you're finding a way to manage both together. And it's, it, I appreciate it's not always that easy. I know we've had spells where Graham has been in a really bad place and unfortunately it is part he never had this before he had the dystonia before so we've always linked the two together but i know there are others that are often in the same board as well okay. yeah so now we've got a, a comment over here right one, that question. one second Can you about saying yeah i think what i was going to say was somebody once said um when you tell your story if it doesn't make you cry then that means you've healed Mental health is an issue. Um, it was never, again, same as dystonia, I suppose. Um, people sort of denied that there was a such thing called mental health. It affects, look, we're all different. Every one of us is different. So mental health is an issue. Um, I think the government has actually recognized that mental health is an issue. And it's, there's a lot of support available uh, through uh, different channels. But I think the event today really is about awareness of dystonia, um, and that's really where we should be concentrating. I'm back just in time. <laughs> oh, <hi. laughs> yeah. Hello, um, I've had cervical dystonia for 22 years now and counting, and I've seen many different uh, consultant neurologists, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And at no point, and, and this, this isn't a question, it's a statement, but it ties in nicely with what you were just talking about. At no point during my 22 plus years, oops, sorry, have I been asked the question, how are you? How are you dealing with this? How is this affecting your mental health, your well-being? And it's ironic because I work in the mental health field and it's quite disgusting actually and offensive that this question has never been asked of me personally. Um, so yes, I just I wanted to put that out there. I don't expect an answer. I just wanted to say it and to share that. Thank you. Yeah, to me, I think kind of I totally agree with that. I think kind of it's something that um, medical professions um, should absolutely be asking, um, and anybody with dystonia should be getting support for it. Uh, I I think you know again kind of following on from the previous uh, question. Um, inevitably there will be some mental health issues with dystonia and depends on you know what level or what degree I suppose and you know what your definition of mental health is sometimes but I, I think you're going to have ups and downs I mean Carol's right you know again with Graham and many others you know you, you're, you're going to ha that will happen and it's perfectly normal to happen um, you know, obviously I've had 40 years of it and, you know, I, this, I'm 63, going on 64 in September. And a lot of my years were, were lost, basically, you know, my, I was 23 years of age when, when this came on. Um, it's not what I expected. <laughs> I didn't do a year abroad in, in Spain from, from a degree and, um, you know, 23, 22, 23 years of age. And, you know, the best years, as they say, are ahead of you, supposedly. And I suppose they were to an extent, but just uh, my life totally changed as a result of it. So you know, everybody's life run about be changed, to be fair. You know, it's, so it's affecting me mentally, I suppose, as well as physically, but also uh, mentally, my, my family run about me and friends and so on. Because, again, it's, this is not the DK that they were used to. Uh, all of a sudden, you know, he went away for a year and came back with something wrong with his neck. You know, that's what happened. Um, but you can you get you can have adapted eventually, and you know it, it does take time, a lot of time, um, and you know I'll keep on fighting it until whenever. But um, you have to, you know, I think that's the only way to do it. You have to be kind of as strong and as positive as you, as you can be, but at the same time, I think it has to be recognised that you people do need support, whether it's from their own immediate family. Just very simple things like just, you know, recognising that you're having a bad day. Um, 
that when you kind of um, snap at your wife for something stupid, you know, it could be because it was something stupid, or that just you're not have, you're having a bad day. Sounds oh. like personal experience, that DK. Yeah, well, <laughs> possibly. <laughs> Regrettably, I'm not perfect. <laughs> Far from it. Um, but I think, you know, you know, we're all human at the end of the day. And I think, you know, like, you know it's, it, it, and, but again, to be fair to the medical profession, they've got so many things they have to deal with these days. And I think post-COVID in particular, things are even more difficult for them. Um, but it, it, even so, we've got dystonia. And, you know, we also deserve to have the level of support and care that um, anybody else would have with some other condition. So um, don't be scared to ask the question because there's nothing stupid about asking that kind of question of your doctor or anybody else because you have to look after yourselves. But when you can't do that, then get somebody else to, to give you that support and care um, because, you know, we all deserve that. Uh, and I think, you know, you know, with with all of us kind of doing doing that, then there will be more publicity, more awareness of dystonia, and people eventually will recognise it, and there will eventually be a better level of service and care given given to all of us. So um, stick with it. But yes, um, 100%. I agree with that. Um, mental health is something that does affect us all, varying degrees, and we should have support, more support than is currently available. Thank you. We have a question from the audience, and I have one more on, on slide. I apologise if we don't get to all your questions, but there's a lot, uh, and then we do need to move on to the next session. So, Yeah, sorry, thank you for sharing that. I just wanted to ask, is there any um, sort of avenue more direct for that kind of support? Like, because, you know, like, like the lady was saying, you know, when you do sort of raise, it's more like the, uh, the physical, you know, like your injections or whatever, you know, you might be getting. Is there any way to sort of get through that? And I know it's, it's about asking, but is there anything sort of, you know, more direct, please. Uh, well, from, from, from my perspective, again, I, I can only speak from the, um, the Scottish side of things uh, and maybe different elsewhere, although I've had experience of travelling down to London for the botch line and toxin injections for about two or three years there. Um, it's, there is nothing specific, I'm afraid, that I can turn and say that would make a huge difference except perseverance. Um, just keep, keep going, you know, keep at them. Um, it's, you know, th there's no reason why, you know, the, the medical profession should not be giving you that. Um, they, will, they will raise all sorts of issues around, you know, there's no money and there's no people around. Yeah, yeah, you, you, you can accept that, but at the same time, still keep at them. But the other way, can, and again, I touched on it before, is this thing around um, intervention with your, with your local politicians and your, your national politicians. They're the ones who control budgets at the end of the day. They make the decisions. You know, regardless of the government that's in, it doesn't really matter at the end of the day. They're the ones who make those decisions. So uh, stick at them, get on at them, you know, campaign. Uh, even go out and, you know, I, I don't think there's been a dystonia march ever, but I would suggest there is a, it should be a dystonia march, yeah, you know. I, I, well, I know, I know, yeah. <laughs> and there are only three or four of you as well, Dana. So, yeah, I think you guys, by the way, just, you know, as a, an aside, you do a fantastic job, all of you. Preparing for this conference has been fantastic. Um, and, you know, and you've got uh, not that much resource-wise, you know, the Dystonia UK is a small charity, um, needs a lot more support. Um, but at the same time, I think all of us can, can, have, can help that by maybe arranging things locally to, to raise awareness. And whether it's things like a march, um, then I think that helps. And the reason that's in my head just now is because and the island I'm from um, has had a difficult initiative around transport and getting off the island because of ferries. Um, for the very first time ever, you know, the, the community is not known for uh, being um, radical in that sense. You know, had a, had a march uh, on the island, but also the same thing happened in Glasgow to great effect. Um, lots of publicity um, on all news channels and so on. It would raise awareness, but even kind of like the Estonia can't do on its own. I would say the one in six campaign, you know, definitely should be doing that. All the neurological charges together. That's the way you kind of get people to listen. Neurology is kind of like is something that's not um, top, I'm afraid, of the three in the medical profession. There are not that many of them. There are lots of um, vacancies. There's lots of issues around it. But at the same time, you know, we've got to keep on doing that. And I think, you know, working with the other charities, we will raise awareness. So... Again, you know, if it's not a dystonia march, then a one in six march. Yeah. 
So I'm all for it. Uh, I hope that answers your question. There's lots of chats coming up about it later as well, so uh, you'll get more answers, I think. Uh, we are running out of time for this panel, so I just want to ask you if you can very quickly, and that sounds awful given the question I'm about to ask. Somebody has asked, and I'm going to paraphrase, you guys have talked a lot about helping others and, and what you do for that. Um, and while it isn't necessarily about raising awareness, they've asked what you do when you're having a rough day as to how how you make yourselves feel better or how you, where you find support. So Q, I'm going to go to you first. Actually, that's a very good question because um, as much as you know, we may come across as being very confident, you know, full of energy. Um, I mean, for me personally, um, what affects me is the spasms. And when I have the spasms, um, you know, I have to sort of walk away from if I'm with friends or family um, because I don't really want them to see what I'm suffering. Um, it may only last 30 seconds, but they're so painful that, you know, I, rather than sharing with them, I'm actually hiding from them. So I think for me, to, you know, to, to overcome that, I really need to be able to uh, let the people who are very close to me see what I'm going through and, and, and give them the opportunity to be able to support me. So, oh, yeah, I mean, it, it, it is tough. Um, and, you know, we were talking earlier on about uh, various platforms that we can uh, uh, sort of uh, share or uh, promote awareness. Social media is obviously a very powerful media. If you use in the right hands, um, obviously it can backfire as well. Um, so I think for me, it's just being able to share with very close people who are in my life to be able to understand what I go through um, and that once I can do that then I think that will, that will help me to, to, to overcome what I go through. Okay, Carol I'm going to throw it over to you because we've got a lot of family in the audience as well it's not just people with the condition you know we've said before on this panel we've said it on webinars it affects everyone in the family when a family member develops dystonia. How do you if you're having a rough day or Graham's having a rough day how do you cope with that? Um, you just do, to be honest. It's not anything that I do specifically. I do occasionally if it is a really rough, and it tends to be a build-up of over a while rather than just a rough day. Um, I'll just take myself off and do something for me, and take some time for me because if I'm not right, I can't then help Graham. So I have to take that time to just downtime and chill. And I have some phenomenal friends who support me in that way and will. I've got a really good friend who knows if I'm having a bad day and she'll say, I'm coming to get you, we're going out and that's it, we're just going. Yeah. So it's just taking some time for yourself every now and again and acknowledge that it's okay to do that. You are there as a carer for whoever, but you can't care for them. And I keep getting told this off my GP frequently because we, as I'm sure many others do, I have health conditions of my own and my GP and the nurse is always saying, if you don't look after yourself, you can't look after whoever it is, whether it's your husband or your children or whatever. So just take some time out just for you every now and again and just do what you need to do to relax and recharge your batteries. And so yourself. And I will say it, gin and tonic helps every now and again. <laughs> <laughs> I'm honest. <laughs> I'm honest. I will say that there's, there's, there's a second point to tell party <laughs> later if you're attending. <laughs> DK, I'm going to let you have the final brief word um, because we do have to move on to the next session. How do you cope? Because you are an incredibly positive people. I mean, you all are. What happens when you're you're not feeling quite so quite so positive? Carl took my line away there about drinking tea, but anyway, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I suppose kind of like you know, I'm a I'm a um, a Celtic fan for my sins and. Um, I kind of probably immerse myself in finding out kind of like where Celtic are sitting in the, in the league table, just usually top, which that's okay, um, and or trying to find out who our next signing is going to be because it's a close season. So, uh, I, basically, I divert my head, my mind to something else. I kind of I do not focus on dystonia. I focus on something that is of interest to me. So, in my case, yeah, it's sport, football, but it could be any sport really. Um, and I'll go and watch something on the telly, um, and it could be anything. Um, Fiona and my wife might be watching golf, I'll go and watch golf on the telly, but that's what I do. You know, I, I don't kind of go out for you know, long walks or anything like that because it's, it's sore, basically. Uh, I'm also 
um, not as fit as I used to be. I pretend to think I can still play football, but well, anyway, maybe not. Um, I still think I could run, but you know, I will sometime. <laughs> I did two half marathons yonks ago, but when I was younger. But I do intend to try to do something like that again. You know, anyway, <laughs> I don't know if I'll actually do that. <laughs> I know. So that's what I do. I kind of basically just kind of take my mind off it, you know, and um, by doing something that I actually quite enjoy. I think you know, if we can all focus too much on dystonia and somebody, um, and, and I know that's difficult, you know, sometimes to do, to be fair. Um, somebody asked me just before, just before I came in here, you know, about, I, was, I used to work with the society, as I said, for, for four years, but I was basically eating, sleeping, living dystonia. And I had to get away from that. So I ended up taking a totally different job um, and, you know, getting myself immersed in that. The dystonia didn't go away. The dystonia was always there. But it's a distraction thing. It is a total distraction, in a sense. Yes, the job, so I focused on the job at that time, and that's, that, that became really important. But, you know, you're still living, it's like a, a parallel kind of universe, in a sense. You've got your dystonia here, you've got your other life here. But you have to live them both together somehow. And sometimes they clash, and sometimes you can't do the things that you want to do. Um, but you find a way, and, you know, or you get other people to help you find a way. Um, and I think we all need that, to have something or somebody who can help us to, to be distracted. Um, because that then brings us into a more positive frame of mind, and it helps us deal with our dystonia. Fantastic. And we only ran five minutes over time, which <laughs> I, I think is remarkable, given our panel. Uh, guys, thank you very much. I think what you've all said is really important. While this panel was about how we raise awareness and how we talk more about dystonia because you have dystonia does not mean that um okay fine fine we've, we've heard it that was, that was absolutely it's because i can't see her over there um okay uh dystonia isn't all you are and we'll talk a lot about it today but there is there is more to all of you than just that um and so while we want to highlight the condition to raise awareness of it we do that so that everybody in here can make, can live a very normal life. Q Carol D K. I remembered all your names. Go me. Thank you so much, guys. Massive round of applause.